This episode of the Gentleman's Golf Law Podcast is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash gentsgolflaw to help produce the show. You are listening to the Gentleman's Golf Law Podcast. Listener beware. Rise and shine, the liquor store is open. I ain't got time for moping. I best be on my way Well, I still got time to save my reputation. Time to go. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Gentleman's Golf Law Podcast, the podcast for the rebel and the renaissance man. I'm your host, Jordan Crowder. Co-hosting with me, as per usual, is the Don, Donovan Fowler. How you doing? Hello. I'm good. I'm good, you man. Good? Um, as you know, uh, with each show, we got to start off a little bit of housekeeping, uh, which we'll do that yep. in a sec. Um, later on on the show... We have uh, Joseph Barkley on. He's a pastor and a good friend of mine. We're going to talk about the his message series, The State of Disunion, and uh, the state of disunion that's going on very, in the country very, right now. Very thematic as to what's actually happening right now. <laughs> yeah, couldn't, have been, couldn't have come at a better time, you know? Come at a better time. People are out there. The mosquitoes are out. The country's on fire, and everybody's yeah. drinking hard seltzer. Yeah, that hard seltzer, that Brian seltzer, seltzer, I don't know what that was. Uh, there's uh, everything. It's White Claw. Every, every. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's that's the real problem with America, if you ask me. I want I want to start a uh, a seltzer water line called uh, Brian, like the Brian Seltzer uh, <laughs> Orchestra. Wait, is it Brian Stelter? Is that the well, that that, the guy's name? That's a CNN guy, but Brian Seltzer. Yeah is uh, one of the greatest guitar players of all time and uh, kind of a showman, big pompadour. We used uh, to play in the Stray uh, Cats. Yeah, there we go. Well, both brought back swing and rockabilly at two uh, different decades. No, he's still alive. Well, then reach out to him. Maybe yeah. you can get a little George Foreman deal going on and, <laughs> and start peddling that hard seltzer water. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of which, we are continuing our series called Junk Whiskey June. What uh, whiskey do we have going on today, Donovan? All right. So today we're going to dive into a little bit of scotch. Uh, Full disclosure, I've never actually tried this, uh, this little guy here. Uh, But this is J&B Rare. J&B Rare. uh, Which is uh, Justerini and Brooks. It's. Scotch whiskey. We'll get into a little bit of the history of it. Yeah. Some interesting factoids about it. But uh, I chose this because I thought we should have a scotch on the list. And this was always sort of what I always associated with kind of a working man scotch. Yeah. Like, you know, this isn't necessarily what you're going to, you know, you'll break it out at parties or you'll maybe have it for like, you know, maybe above the refrigerator after a long day's work. <laughs> yeah. Um, you come, come story. in and you throw your fedora on a hook yes. and then you, yeah. you take your, your, uh, your Jack revolver out of a holster. <laughs> yeah. Out of your shoulder holster. Well, I guess it could also be a side <laughs> holster. You know? No, it has uh, to be a shoulder holster. Uh, the, uh, brown leather. Fun fact about this actually is um, my uh, so my dad uh, he I think this was his first uh, drink, and he said that he <laughs> he associates bad memories with it as oh, in like no. he said it tasted like gasoline. We'll see, but it was my grandpa's. Uh, I think uh, I think it was my grandpa's choice of uh, whiskey, All which right. is funny because my grandpa used to always tease me as a kid. He, whenever I was drinking root beer out of the bottle, he would always say, uh, he's like, oh, what are you doing there? Drinking a little whiskey? <laughs> Anyways, That's such um, an old man joke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my grandfather used to do that, too. Like if I was drinking like uh, ginger ale or something. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah. Speaking of which, I mean, we haven't really talked about colors on this, but this almost has the consistency of Speaking of which, before ale. we get st- started on tasting this, I should say what I'm smoking here. Um, oh, I am yeah, smoking yeah. Uh, my, uh, this is my Stanwell uh, brushed billiard pipe. Is that a new pipe? No, it's an old one. Really? It's like the 50s it's a dad pipe. pipe. Or or the Cosmo Kramer pipe. Um, <laughs> yeah. And in it, I have got, uh, this is a very special blend, Donovan. 
Let's see. This is graveyard my own mixture. Ooh. Graveyard wow. mixture. That's a big jar too. Number Where'd 15. you get that from? Well, uh, I started smoking a pipe in 2015, and every time there'd be like uh, little bits and bobs oh, at the bottom of. Oh uh, my gosh! So I've you this is just totaled a bunch of random stuff, and when you open what it up. Earth? Dude. And get a whiff. There's a bunch of memories in there. Like I just smell all different tobaccos. Some paper and just <laughs> smoke it as a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about like, doing that, making pipe cigarettes, but that probably wouldn't be good for you. I've done that before, actually. Yeah. It was it was How's a little too strong. Admittedly, it was it was a little too strong. A little too strong. But you're yeah, not supposed. I guess you wouldn't inhale that because it's not. Like, I don't know. It's not the. Oh, I you did. don't inhale type pipe tobacco. It's not like. It's not processed for that. But is it really? Uh, is it really that big of a difference? I don't know. Maybe not. Like if you just roll up a cigarette with no filter. Well, Anyways. I think it depends on the type because aromatics have certain toppings on it that you probably wouldn't want to inhale. But all right, let's get your review of this pipe tobacco real, right. uh, real quick because I have a feeling that that's about all it's going to be. Is it's just going to be like, yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> what are you getting? Are you are you are you are you getting any like familiarities? Is this mm. taking you back to like yep. you know March 2015 you know or you know what I'm getting is Christmas 2015 tw uh, 2016 <laughs> because I had a blend called Holiday Spirit by McClellan um, that no longer that exists, one, yeah. and there's yeah. some of that in there um, mixed in. This is just a bunch of aromatic stuff. So it's all kind of in the same vein, a lot of like dessert, vanilla kind of stuff. Um, and so that's what I'm Favorite. getting. It still reminds me of that out of it more than anything. Dude, I got to freaking get my pipe out here and I got to start smoking again. Cause, uh, I need some of that aromatic cherry or some of that, uh, vanilla rum or whatever. Whatever the kids are into these days. Whatever the kids are into um, these days. All right, let's get started with our junk duty whiskey. Free. <laughs> duty free. Um, all right. So, <laughs> so uh, let's go ahead and give this a whiff. Like I said, the consistency is sort of a ginger ale, actually. It's it's very light, light colored. Yeah. But, um, well, yeah, it does look like ginger ale. Like Canada dry. You know, it's funny. I, I feel like my allergies are kicking in, so I'm not getting much off this. It doesn't help that I just took some uh, Alka Seltzer for my allergies just before this. I don't know. I'm not going to be able to give any your like, tongue and your nose. I'm not going to be able to give any nose on this. I don't know why I just smelled like the microphone. It doesn't have a very strong. Uh, uh, it doesn't have a very strong like draw through the nose. So let's go yeah. ahead and take a taste. Hmm. Mm. Dances on the tongue a little bit. Oh, mm. yeah, I do get that gasoline thing that your dad was talking about. Hmm. <sighs> I'm not getting a lot of the. Is there peat in it? I mean, all scotch has no, peat. No, it's right? not very peaty. Because I don't, least as I don't get as I any peat tell. out of it. It's actually kind of a little. It's got like a sweetness, kind of vanilla. Okay. Uh, and I think I that's that like the biggest bit. flavor I'm going to be able to draw from it, unless I kind of maybe take another taste here. Let's let's. What Let's I want to know, pack. though, is what is the point of scotch without peat? Because then it's just kind of like generic whiskey, isn't it? Mostly. Mm. Like, it, like it could might as well could, a bit, could be a bourbon or something. It's a good question. I mean, what makes it? No, because peat doesn't necessarily peaty. Peaty. Pretty bird. Pretty bird. <laughs> um, <laughs> points if people get that reference. Our pets' heads are falling off. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, the uh, peatiness of it, I think, is just an extra. I think the actually what makes a scotch is the um, the malt, the malt like okay. like the the uh, mixture of the grains and stuff, like with the bourbon. Yeah, uh, I mean the bourbon, like the the charred oak barrels, is a big thing with the bourbon. But mainly, what makes it a bourbon is the the mixture of, of barley and, and, and everything. So with, with scotch, I'd have to take another look. It's funny thinking back to about this time last year, I was getting into whiskey again and I was really starting to taste the whiskey, but I was doing it in the worst way. Cause I was basically like, Oh, I'll just start with scotch and yeah. I'll start with like, 
I don't want to like rub anybody the wrong way here, but I, I probably started with like the worst scotch you could start with, which was the Trader Joe's <laughs> like uh, label scotch. It was like the, was it the Highlander know. scotch or whatever they call it? Uh, it was the like I I I just know that I really I think fell short of the mark because after I'd gone on my bourbon journey, I got like a space side uh, scotch from. Uh, uh, Trader Joe's and it was it, it just did not like I, I was mean, like oh, this, I bought some this, at Trader it, Joe's that I really liked called Finlagen Finlagen okay so that's a different thing okay the the trader but the Trader Joe's label scotch okay. I, I'm just saying like it's not terrible but it's not very good you know yeah. it's just like it's it's average very average so um especially like the uh the red label that they have there I'd like to do a comparison with Johnny Walker one of these days but anyways so this is blended and just reading and Brooks actually have a long history back in, uh, in merry old England. Um, and, uh, basically they, are you going to tell me a story, Don? What? Uh, let me tell you a story. Um, yeah. they go back to, uh, 1749. One fun little fact about them is that the firm has been a supplier to every British monarch since the coronation of George the third in 1761, which Whoa. we as Americans don't take cut too kindly to that we because, don't. you know, Matt King George was, uh, we don't he wasn't acknowledge the King's sovereignty. Yeah. But they made up for it later when they started to do their blended scotch, uh, so it says, seeing the potential of blended whiskey, J and B was one of the first London spirits merchants to buy up stocks of mature malt whiskey and create its own quote house blend. Uh, this was named Club. Blah 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 blah. Eventually, uh, Charles Dickens, who's one of my favorite authors, was uh, a frequenter of their uh, establishment. Oh, nice. And uh, during Prohibition, Justerini and Brooks, it, it changed. It's funny. It changed names after a while. Like, like at one point, I think one of the owners, this Johnson fellow from the early days, he got like a horse collided with his buggy and killed him on the oh, way back. Geez. Like, like he was like having tea. That was with a the thing. Th People didn't get hit by cars. They got hit by horses. My grandmother true, lost, yeah. lost like two yeah. siblings that way. Jeez Louise. Like run over by beer carts, <laughs> hit by horses. Um, so anyways, uh, last point here is that during Prohibition, Justerini and Brooks was promoting a brand that they had created specifically for the American market, J&B Rare, which is what we're drinking now. Uh, when Prohibition came to an end in 1933, their activities began to pay dividends in and around New York City. So this gained popularity, I think, uh, through various forms of media. I think like the Rat Pack would drink it uh, in, in a lot of their like little short uh, films and commercials. And um, also, if anybody out there is a fan of the movie The Thing or John Carpenter's the Thing, uh, this is the scotch that uh, that Kurt Russell drinks in the movie, really? which is quite prominent because he ends up making like Molotov cocktails out of it later. Oh, yeah. But uh, but yeah, yeah I, you know what? I'm going to say based off of I, here's the thing. My dad tried this, I think, when he was just a youngin. Yeah. So I think he had the reaction to like when you dr try beer as a kid, it tastes like soap suds. When you try alcohol as a kid, it either tastes like nail polish remover or gasoline. Yeah. And, um, I, uh, but you know what? I'm liking it. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say that, you know, out of the, oh man, it's tough out of the, the junk whiskeys that we tried this and Jack Daniels may actually, uh, be like a regular kind of shelf thing really? for me. I yeah, still, still a I, fan of the Evan Williams. I am a fan of Evan Williams. Well, we didn't throw Evan Williams in here because I think Evan Williams is kind of our mainstay. That's <laughs> like true. Evan Williams is well, he's back here. I got yeah. I got Evan. Oh, by the way, full circle with with uh, our little experience on this. I did find out why the bottles are square. Oh yeah. And it's not <laughs> wasn't there some I, I read the fact that like the the reason that uh Jack Daniels wanted the bottles it's to be the best square. Fight in shape, right? But, well you, you <laughs> could even say it was the best fight in shape. I think he said he wanted it to represent equality and like fairness or something like equity and fairness, which I think sounds a little oh, far. So a circle wouldn't represent but, that. But ultimately, yeah, yeah, exactly. So ultimately I found out that the reason that the bottles are square, the reason that that took off was because the bottles wouldn't, uh, roll around in the back of trucks, ah, they stack, which is actually kind of cool. Yeah. So that's anyways, a smart that's, idea. 
yeah. So that's well, that's it. But yeah, we'll be. I, you know what? I think we should uh, we should try to do a part two of this at some point because I was just walking around the liquor store today and I was just like, damn, we got wild turkey. Yeah. We got freaking. Uh, we got all these good little labels. Even Dickel is not super expensive. <laughs> no, <laughs> hey, I, hey, hey, grow up, grow up, um, will you? Come on. Um, <laughs> this is a family show. Um, yeah. yeah, I think we should continue. I think that for July, we're going to continue with Junk Beer July, where mm-hmm. we'll try beer from the bottom shelf. But go ahead and leave us a comment. Let us know uh, what whiskeys or beers you like that are uh, for the cheapskate, because uh, we just let figured us, we would try all these things. Let us know if, if, if there's a better name than Junk Beer. Junk Beer? <laughs> junk, yeah. I don't know if it transfers as well. It just what, doesn't roll off the tongue. Well, what, what would work with alliteration for July? If you <sighs> name it we'll send oh, you something yeah. free oh yeah well junk junk whiskey june I, I don't know it's junk beer july junk beer july could work yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll play around we'll with work it. We'll, with it. we'll put work our heads on together it. we'll um, actually do some work for once and we'll uh speaking we'll of junk whiskey um i came across this this week and uh this this uh character seems like he would probably enjoy some whiskey from the bottom shelf but it was an obituary for an old man <laughs> Named Goodness. Randall Jacobs, uh, who passed away in Phoenix, R.I.P. Um, but yep. this is the type of obituary I think I would want uh, to be to be read at my funeral. It says, <clears throat> Randall Jacobs of Phoenix died at age 65, having lived a life that would have sent a lesser man to his grave decades earlier. His friends called him R.J., but to his family, he was Uncle Bucky, a.k.a. the Bunkster. He told his last joke, which cannot be printed here. <laughs> nice. And this, well, and I think this that picture of this guy, he did actually, look so okay, much older than 65. So I did not. I did not. Yeah. Well, that's what happens when you live in Phoenix, where the average temperature is like 120 <laughs> degrees. Um, I, uh, uh, I saw the picture. I didn't read the obituary because I wanted to be surprised. And uh, that is a lovely little uh, uh, obit. But uh, the picture looks like Roy Scheider and James Wood had a very unhappy baby. <laughs> it's true. With cataracts, maybe. <laughs> I was like, who does that guy look like? <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, the sheriff from Jaws and that guy on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, that, guy, that guy on Twitter who says all the crazy stuff. Um, hey, James Woods is a he's a he's he's a national treasure either way. <laughs> you know, we're all look th- crazy. That happened the other day yeah. where uh, uh, Lacey and I were driving, and uh, some Shania Twain came on the radio, and uh, she started making fun of Shania Twain, and I said. I said, careful, that woman's a national treasure. Yeah. You're about to cross <laughs> fucking lines. About to cross fucking lines. <laughs> and um, so. I uh, get canceled doing that voice. Yeah, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it's funny. Wasn't there some baseball star who recently, uh, uh, or maybe it was some sports star recently pronounced his love for Shania Twain. Really? I don't know what the deal was. But, I mean, but, as a teenager, I had a big crush on Shania Twain. Um, not just because she was Canadian, but because she was Shania Twain. Um, See, I don't remember her very well. I just remember seeing a, a Super Bowl halftime show where she got on a cherry picker uh, and, uh, and yeah, went up and was singing to the audience. And I was like, that's a cheap way of elevating somebody <laughs> above the a audience. That's a way. cherry picker. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Jeez. She was Canadian. They, they had a lower budget. It. I'm not saying that like it was it was the Super Bowl. It wasn't her it wasn't her fault. The it Canadians were budget. putting on a Super Bowl. It, it was the uh production value of the whole thing. Yeah. Anyways, I just I, I <laughs> found that funny. comic at the time. Um saw this other headline here. It says Charlie Theron slam Steven Seagal as overweight, unable to fight, and not very <laughs> nice to women. Oh jeez. I'm not the biggest fan of Charlize Theron. I did think that she was great in Mad Max Fury Road, which is one of my favorite movies. Um, but, but yes, this the, sounds like the, uh, she made something. This sounds like Steven Seagal. I mean, I don't oh, know yeah. if you've ever seen, there's some videos you can go down the wormhole on Absolutely, the internet, yes. but Steven Seagal is a complete phony. <laughs> like, Have you seen him running? No. Oh my gosh, <laughs> dude. There are videos. I, I, I mean, I I hate making fun of 
I, I hate making fun of people sometimes, but like Steven Seagal is sort of an overinflated ass that, you know, it's, he's an easy target, but uh, the way that he runs is, is very, very comical. And um, also uh, that Lawman show, there's just so much, there's just so yeah, much about Steven the, Seagal. The, the, so was it Lawman aware. where he's like, it's like a, a cop's show where he yes. actually re- arrests people. He becomes like a sheriff or whatever. <laughs> and like, it's funny. He like puts I've been on hearing like Joe a Rogan. Cajun accent or something. Yes. Yes. I've been hearing Joe Rogan talk about it a lot lately and how he puts on a, a lot of people talk about it. Like I was seals talk about him because of his, uh, you know, uh, under siege, that movie where he plays a seal fighters talk about him because he's really, you know, he was like championing Aikido or Aikido. And, uh, I don't know about his fighting skills. I have heard some people say that he's actually good, but, but he, then other people seem to challenge imply him, that he's not, he's not really fighting people who are very good. No, like, that's and the also only- like he always like he always throws down a challenge, like throws it out the window because he says it's too dangerous for you. Oh yeah, if yeah. I were to fight well, you, it'd be too dangerous and stuff like if that. His, if his hairpiece flies <laughs> off and accidentally suffocates you, that's the one thing about Steven Seagal that I'm always fascinated by, and by actors in general, in the sense that like they will be caught. And I understand like it's hard, like when you're an actor and you're trying to make your hair look good outside of like a movie where you could, you have all the control of lighting and, and camera angle and everything. It, there are pictures of him from like the late eighties or early nineties where he's clearly yeah. bald. Like he's yeah. basically bald or he's got severe receding hairline. And then you look at him today or like, you know, late nineties, early two thousands. <laughs> and he's got like, people make fun of John Travolta yeah, and other actors for either their hair plugs or their toupees. But Steven Seagal takes it to a whole different level. It's like, so it's like somebody took a, um, like somebody oh, painted it on. Yeah. It, and then it they really pulled does it really like tight that. back. Like sharpie, like kind of thing. No, but it doesn't <laughs> even look like it's pulled tight back. It just looks like it's just sitting there <laughs> and it's just been placed very neat. But anyways, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's just what it is what it is. But uh, apparently the Russians, the last I heard, the Russians love Steven Seagal. I know. I don't know what that's about, but I don't know. The Russians are kind of weird. Russians they, like, you know. Russians like uh, fake strong, strong-arming people. All right. This let's, is true. Let's go to a little segment we like to call. Listener Mail. All right. Uh, now is the part of the show where we interact with you, the listener. Uh, so thank you for leaving all your comments. Uh, you could go ahead and leave us any comment on any social media platform at Gent Scoff Law, or you could call the phone number man 81 scoff 2 Fs, um, and leave us a voicemail. Uh, also, you can go ahead to iTunes and leave us a review, which helps support the show, helps us with our search rankings, but also gives us some fodder for the show. Uh, the best reviews, we've had some pretty funny reviews, get read on the show. So why not take a stab and get featured? True. All yeah, right. Put, put your balls out there. <laughs> um, this <laughs> You might as well. Um this one comes from Paul, and it says, Hey, gents, any recs for a mustache care, oils, waxes, combs, etc.? Wanted to learn from the best. Smiley face wearing sunglasses. Paul. Um, that's a good question. Um, You'd I would probably have more of a more of a draw on that than I would. I would uh, first recommend uh, going to gentlemanscofflaw.com slash shave. And get uh, some products from our good friends over at Phoenix Shaving. Um, they have a mustache wax there. It's called Dapper Docs, and it's uh, it's uh, it's based on a, a kind of a. I think it's based on actually on Doc Holliday's kind of what maybe a, a gentleman of that era would have worn as a scent. But it's a really good thick waxy uh, mustache wax that. Uh, a lot of that mustache wax sometimes is just like too soft, you know, and that stuff is really good for shaping a mustache or for keeping it from if you've got kind of unruly hairs. Um, but you should start there. Um, and if you have a beard, get their beard oil. We talk, we've talked about them a ton. Um, but also their shaving sets. So if you're shaving down just to a mustache, um, 
you're going to need a good, you know, razor edge that could, you know, shape that thing. And uh, they have some great double edge safety razors or single edge safety razors, too, that will help you maintain that. Uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, Donovan, what does that other comment say there uh, from Instagram? First, there was the vampire, and now the murder hornet. Donovan's role on this show is eventually going to be featured on, quote, Dangerous Jobs series. It's true. I, uh, yeah. you know, I, I pride myself on, uh, you know, going into rooms and, and being on air with very dangerous types. Yeah, and uh, it's, hey, it's all for the, you know, it's all for the viewer at home. We yeah. got to, we got to expose these people. Do you like when that, that woman, was it? I can't remember if it was Barbara Walters or not. Who when she interviewed Fidel Castro? <laughs> That's what oh. you like. Oh boy, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see that one. But you know, uh, <laughs> next week we'll have Chris D'Elia. You know, <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> we could, uh, yeah. speaking of yeah, dangerous thing. interviews. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, thanks for doing that, Donovan. Thanks for putting yourself out there and uh, taking one for the team all the time. Yeah, I sometimes know. it really sucks. I mean, uh, now I am technically a vampire after having been bitten twice. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we have a comment here on uh, on Stitcher, and uh, it says it's a review. He says five stars from Chrome Dome. He says funny right from the start. Great chemistry between the hosts, and I dig the concept. Well, thank you very much for that. We appreciate nice. that. Um, Chrome Dome, what a great username. Speaking of Steven Dining. Seagal, Chrome Dome. Maybe the Steven Seagal left this, <laughs> this review. <laughs> he's he's alluding to his <laughs> what what he his real his real self. His real self. It's um, entirely possible. All right. Let's uh, again, if you want to participate on this part of the show, go ahead and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher and Google Play or wherever else you listen to us. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with Joseph Barkley. Gentlemen, 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 and scofflaws. I just wanted to take a second to tell you about the relaunch of our Gentleman Scofflaw online store. If you're a listener and you want to help support the show, this is a great way to start. Now we're offering premium apparel at an even better price than before, and we have styles for both you gentlemen and the Lady Scofflaw listeners out there. Right now, we've launched our classic series that has the infamous Gentleman Scofflaw insignia you know and love on a premium tee, hoodie, or jumper. We also have a boyfriend tee and slouchy jumpers for the Lady Scofflaws that, you know, want something a little more stylish. And to celebrate this launch, through the month of July, we're offering 20% off your order. If you're watching on YouTube, you can click the banner below. Otherwise, go to GentlemanScofflaw.com and click the shop link and then use the code JULY20 at checkout for 20% off. That's just a little way of saying thank you for saying thank you. And now, back to the show. All right, Donovan, I'm excited to have this guest, a good friend of mine, and been wanting to get him on here for a while. Uh, the one, the only, Pastor Joseph King Barkley. Thank you for coming on, man. Oh man, I'm I'm happy to be here. Hi guys. Hi, how you doing? I had to use I, I had to use your middle name because that's such a great middle name. <laughs> yeah, it's a great middle name. <laughs> it's on it is, man. It's my great grandfather's, my grandfather's, my dad's, and mine. And then I only have daughters, yeah. so. <laughs> it all stops with me, oh, like no. so many things. Oh, jeez! <laughs> <laughs> you could always name. You could have given them the queen. Uh, queen. You know, moniker. Oh, that's that true. Worked, that that's have, true. <laughs> then they would have asked, him, like, "Well, my father's na- uh, middle name was King, so." Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm Queen. <laughs> um, yeah, Joseph. For uh, our listeners that don't know you, I'd love to just give them a little bit about like your background and where you started and um, what you did before you were a pastor and how you became to be one. Yeah. Well, I'll give you the the shortest version I know how to give. I was born in Southern California and was raised by a, a dad who's in finance. And I thought I was going to be a corporate attorney. So I went to college for business uh, for the most part and got that degree. But while I was there, I picked up a guitar and uh, fell in love with it uh, and I gave I sort of just jumped in uh, headlong, and by the end of my time, my undergrad, those four years, I had signed a recording contract, and then that started 10-plus years of touring and writing music as a professional musician, like like paying the bills professional musician. 
during that time, I met and married my wife. And what brought the touring to an end was we decided we wanted to have kids and we knew we didn't want that to be life on the road. So I moved my touring, uh, my professional life touring into writing songs for television, uh, just using some relationships I had. And that was great. It kept me at home and it was lucrative. Uh, and at that time, we also got involved in a, a local faith community in Hollywood, which is where all my artists and musician friends were. And it was a place where they talked a lot about uh, spiritual ideas and Jesus and the Bible and uh, things I was deeply interested in. But what was equally as interesting to me is they had created a space where people who'd never gone to a church also wanted to go and have these conversations. And that kind of ruined me uh, in, a, in the best ways because uh, I don't want to be a part of uh, anything different than that moving forward. So a few years go by, I actually helped start one of those uh, communities. It's a church called Ecclesia. That's in Hollywood. My wife and I helped start that. And then, uh, oddly, and this is the shortest version I know how to tell, is I was given a chance to teach there. I was still a professional musician, but I found I loved it. And as hard as the work was to do that, uh, it connected more. I was more passionate about it. I I would rather have taught another message than written another song. Uh, and so during really at the zenith of my music career to that point, a radical life change, we just decided I'm going to go into doing ministry full time. And that led uh, a couple years later into starting a church in North Hollywood, which is, there's not a lot of churches there, but there's a lot of people. It's a deeply artistic community, incredibly diverse in every sense of that word. Uh, and we want to create a space like we'd fallen in love with, a place where we have conversations about the biggest questions of life, but we do it in a way that people from all points on every political and religious spectrum can feel welcomed and they can be themselves and hear language they understand so they can make up their own minds uh, and show shocking hospitality. So we started a church called Radius just over five years ago in North Hollywood. And that's what I do now. I hope that was concise. Yeah, no, that, was, that was more than concise. Uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Uh, the first time I went to Radius was five, you know, five years ago when you guys first started doing the weekly uh, services. And oh, yeah. we we had just joined because we were like, we were in a small group with people that had joined the church. And then we were like, uh, we don't know if we're ever going to see these people again. So let's go hang out with them at their church. And then like the next week we were meet, like I was volunteering on the media team. My <laughs> wife was working. I know. You were so ruined it's crazy. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were yeah. ruined. Yeah. Kind of addicting. You know, once you're... <laughs> Once you're in it and you see the kinds of people you get to rub shoulders with and the conversations you get to have, it's like, man, I don't, I can't think of anything more exciting, to be honest. Yeah. It's but, so great how eclectic it is too. Like all the different types of people that go there, which is what struck me immediately. When, like, Yeah. You know, there's hundreds of people. Well, before we went to lockdown, there were hundreds of people meeting every week, but the most exciting stat for me was that. Uh, just based on surveys, because I love to, I love doing surveys to hear people and understand people. And about thirty-five to forty-two percent, about you, like I said, that approximately thirty-five point three to forty-two point six percent of average attendance are people who would not consider themselves Christ followers or Christians. Um, a lot of them had never been to a church in their entire lives. Yeah. And uh, man, what a privilege to get to have big conversations with people like that. So, yeah, I love it. I, well, you've you've created. I think the everybody there has created an environment where they feel safe to kind of to 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 question all those things, whether it's 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 faith questions or like the series you're working on now, which I, I think is great. There's already been two messages, or by the time this goes out, maybe three or four. But um, yeah. talking about about uh, about politics and just kind of engaging with people that uh, may not, you may not have the same views on. Um, in life. And I, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. Um, the series, mm -hmm. what's the series called again? Yeah, we decided to call it state of disunion, sort of a plant <laughs> state of the union. Uh, uh, sounds like a hip hop like album. Description. <laughs> yeah. 
looks good. It's, it definitely yeah. sounds like a hip hop album or something. <laughs> State, State oh, of yeah. yeah, that's a missed opportunity. I should have <laughs> should have written one of those. Or maybe like a like a '90s hardcore band or something. <laughs> but, <laughs> Great. but what's so cool is that you could open up this subject at a place like Radius because there's a we've, there's this environment where people feel safe to talk about this kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah. I'd love to like go through some of the some of the the the, the, the points you're going to cover in the next couple of weeks and what you went over in your first uh, message. Yeah. Um, obviously, we live in a time that is like hyper hyper partisan. Like everything is so mm-hmm. so binary. Uh, I think you, you, you played a uh, uh, Super Mario Brothers uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> video yeah. game that one with all the. F- the, you know, all the different uh, obstacles, and that's like navigating through the political <laughs> landscape right oh, now. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, it's like a screenshot or like a uh, what do they call those where you're watching somebody play a video game? Yeah, um, oh, like yeah, Twitch, Twitch, <laughs> Twitch, Twitch. Twitch. Yeah. it's called something. My godson's yeah. really into it, but it's like a you know, it's like 20 seconds of watching Mario in the hardest level you can imagine. It just gives you anxiety watching yeah. it. I said that that was an MRI scan of someone trying not to offend someone during. <laughs> the- <laughs> That's how I feel, you know. Yeah, yeah so. for sure. It is. I mean, it is really, really hard right now. Like, it seems like it doesn't matter what it is. It seems like you're stepping on some landmine or whatever thing you say. It's like you're drawing a line in the sand. Like all the t- <laughs> people take it that way at, at every time. Hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I I think that, you know, people are what I've often said is that there's nothing that unites us faster than a common enemy, but nothing unites us better than a common purpose. So the easiest way for people to find their tribe is to find who they hate together. Um, And when it seems we're only given two options, which is a delusion, of course, we're given more than that, but we have two options to vote for, then that easily batches people into for and against. You're my side, you're not. And if I want to feel close to people, I don't want to feel alone, I don't want to feel scared, then I'm going to find someone who screams at the same person I'm screaming with, uh, screaming at, and maybe that's my people. Yeah. Uh, whether or not I've really done the hard work of processing through, do I totally align with everything that, that you know, this category or this camp or this side of the aisle is, is promoting. I don't know if I do, not completely, but man, it's the closest mob yeah. to me and I don't want to feel afraid and alone. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's too bad. I, th- I think that there's so much more power in the middle. It's just the middle doesn't feel like they have a voice, yeah. whatever the middle means, you know, moderate perspectives or people with good critical thinking mm. who don't want to be easily categorized. Like you don't get elected if you're someone who is <laughs> patient, compassionate, and empathetic to the <laughs> other side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Doesn't then, make for good national conventions if you stand up there and you're like, you know what? The other candidate really has some pretty good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work very well. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny because I feel, I feel like the, at least in in my in my life, there was a point where I was definitely to one side. Um, but as I kind of analyzed that time in my life, I I realized that. Um, that, that was safe for me. It was easy for me to go this, okay, this is, this is what I believe. And, uh, here is the list of things that it makes it easy for me to categorize things and make sense of the world. If I have this kind of list to follow in a, in a way. And, um, and it's very easy to be dismissive about people on the other side when you have that kind of worldview. Mm -hmm. Um, like what, what, what can people do to like, to, to get out of that kind of mindset. Cause it's like, it's such a, it seems like it's so, it, it's definitely toxic. <laughs> yeah. I think it's toxic and it's also, uh, it, I think reduces our sociological IQ. You know, if I can't, you know, a great debate coach will tell you that if you cannot make your opponent's case for them, you don't truly understand the topic. Mm. And, so one thing I talk to people a lot about is trading in a confirmation bias, which, by the way, we are all susceptible to. And yeah, everything sure. we look at online is algorithmically delivered to us. Like, this is what you looked at before. You want to look at it again? Yeah. You know, the algorithms are not designed to challenge your bias. They are dependent upon it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah. that will lead to more clicks, which often it does. Mm. More clicks down the line means more bucks. Mm. So we already have a confirmation bias. We're being reinforced. That bias is being reinforced. And so we have to 
exercise a discipline of something I'm going to call the consideration bias. Mm. And what that means is when someone comes to us with a what seems like an opposing perspective, and I, this, I'm not making up this idea. It's, I just think it's 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 worth repeating that we would pause and consider the motives, the values, the fears of the person who's uh, maybe looks like they're on the other side of the aisle from us. Typically, that requires an incredible amount of courage and humility because you may discover that they have they have something worth um, saying. They have a point worth making, and it may even change some of your perspective if you're not so dependent on your certainty and making sure you're right all the time. If you're more oriented towards how could I see this person, where they're coming from, uh, then you might find that you have a more nuanced perspective. It, it makes political conversations a little bit more tedious because mm-hmm. you can't give quick answers. But I do think it helps us see the person behind the politics. And that truly, I think that's going to position us for the greatest influence we can have in our relationships. I mean, vote the way you're going to vote in the ballot box, but where you spend most of your life is in relationship. Yeah. And I hope you cultivate a diversity of perspectives in those relationships because it's going to change how you think, how you see the world, deepen your compassion so you can understand and maybe even serve people you would have written off in the past. But you have to start from that consideration bias. Hmm, I, you know what? It doesn't confirm my thinking, but I want to consider where they're coming from. And I think both of us might learn something in the process. Yeah. So that'd be the first thing I would start with is just a, an, a discipline repeatedly every day when you're on Twitter, <laughs> when you're in conversation with family members, what have you, that you would stop to try and understand where's this person coming from. They're the hero in their narrative, like we all are. You're the good guy in your story. Yeah. And so yeah. if somebody disagrees with you, they right. think, well, you're an idiot or you must have bad intentions. Yeah. But we forget that, man, everybody is casting themselves as the good guy in their narrative. So I'm really trying to do the right thing. It just might look different than your version of the right thing. So let's try and and discover what right thing we're trying to do. And maybe we find that that's the same right thing. We yeah. really want what's best for people. We might just disagree on what we think is best for people. That's a lot. But I, I yeah. think it's such a complicated issue um, that it requires some... I, I don't know, some complex thinking to try and address it. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And it's, I mean, when you see things that way, it's so much, it's so much harder to be dismissive to actually listen to the person. Like that's my, my old way of thinking, mm-hmm. or I've said things or I've heard people say things like this. Well, um, if that person thinks this, then I already know everything I know need to know about that person. Yep. Or if that, you know, you could imme- you're immediately putting them in some sort of category based on some preconceived notion you have about one specific statement or even oh, for yeah. me, it was like as a, as a young 20 something, um, it could be like what movie they liked or what music they listened to. I was like, ah, I don't need to hang out with that guy. <laughs> He's so extreme sometimes. Princess Diaries? Really? Yeah. 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 Princess Diaries 2, the, yeah. the sequel. Yeah. 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 Julie Andrews had a, a much more pronounced role in, in part two, so I think oh, that that's making sure. her better. Chris yeah, Pine was in there. We all know the sequel yes. is always better. <laughs> I knew we were kindred. Yeah. <laughs> I also have two daughters, so you know, yeah, I, I, I have four sisters, so that's that. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I don't even think I've no, seen. Jordan, Princess I think that's Dimes. really well said. You know, if you went on to any social media platform and you know searched for a, of of the phrase, these are the same people who yeah, you would come up with yeah. endless results because that's the way most people respond to someone's opinion. You yeah. you voice an opinion or a perspective or you ask a question, and you will often get met with someone out there saying, "Well, this is the same perspective that led to blank." Yeah, and you name it. You know something that puts it puts it through the ceiling. This is the same perspective that led to the Holocaust. It's the same perspective that led to the depression at the same, you know, or these are the same people who, and I think it's, it's, uh, foolish. I think it's uncreative that calcification of people into, Oh, you have a perspective. So I understand a profile now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry, you don't, you are what, uh, the Jewish writers and Jesus and Socrates would all call a fool. <laughs> if that's your perspective. Yeah. Uh, based on one criteria, you can develop a profile. No, yeah. you're just lazy. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty lazy. Um, so when people, a lot of people say, like, there's a, I'm going to quote, uh, 
I think it's Ian McKenzie from Fugazi for anyone who's in a hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> he says everything is political. You, right. That's like a worldview people have. It's like that's that's the first thing. Like if you don't have your politics sorted out, like how do you get through the world kind of thing? So uh, putting yeah. faith before politics, a lot of people would think the two are intertwined. So how do you how sure. are you how do you separate those or can you separate those? Oh, great question. I, I think first we can't say that politics are insignificant. Mm. Uh if we're going to put something before our politics, I don't. We can't too quickly say, well, that means politics don't matter because they certainly do. I mean, the world is is changed by political movements. Mm -hmm. Lives are affected by political movements. And and a good friend of mine and Jordan, you know him, Jason Jaggard, said politics is just another way to describe relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, we have politics in in my marriage. There's politics in a way in our work force, there's going to be politics and you know, parenting, all that. But something that I think we could put before our politics is for those of us who have a faith, you know, I would say I, I endeavor to put my faith before my politics. And what that means is, is that I have a reliance, a perspective of the world that becomes the lens through which I understand politics and maybe more importantly, political conversations. Mm. Like the way that I engage a political conversation, if it's if it's based primarily on my politics, then it probably should be a war. No. There's red coats and blue coats. OK, but if I have something before that uh, that's more powerful or more significant, more defining, then my politics have to serve that thing. So, for instance, uh, I'm somebody who I follow Jesus and he said the most important rule for life is to love God with everything that you are and what I know is important for God, if I'm going to love him with everything, is to love people as much as I love myself. Like very explicit. I love myself a whole heck of a lot. If I'm going to try and love somebody as much as I love myself, I'm going to try and love them first. And so, you know, if I'm going to put that before my politics, that means someone who has an opposing, to use that word, an opposing political view, I first am oriented towards how do I care for that person? Or how do I pay attention to that? See the person behind the position. Um, even the way that I vote, you know, even though we're going to come up with different conclusions, I try to think about what does, how could my vote affect the lives of people, not just my life, but the lives of, of people, because that puts my faith before my politics or, or my politics are informed by my faith. Those are a couple of examples that come to mind for me. Yeah. Um, the other big one, this is huge, is that if my faith comes before my politics, and I hope this is encouraging to to someone listening to the scoff law <laughs> is that that means that my whole, uh, all of my hopes and dreams are not resting on my candidate getting in the Oval Office. Mm. If the person I didn't vote for becomes the leader of the free world, I am not in despair. Yeah. I still have as much purpose as I had the day before the election. Mm. I still have as much hope and sense of security and stability as I had before the election. Uh, so for me to put my faith before my politics is honestly a gift I give myself that no matter what happens in my circumstances, I, I really just I'm not destroyed by that. Yeah. Um, I'm not really knocked off course. So, yeah, there's a, a lot of ways that it's uh, powerful. To, to make that switch. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of eggs to put in one basket in, the, in one person being elected. I mean... <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'm glad I'm not running for office because I know what we try to put on that person. Holy I cow. I mean, yeah, I for sure. I feel bad for most people that are in, <laughs> are in politics. Uh, which yeah. is, like, I, it's funny. You, you introduced me to the Enneagram and... Uh, as I over the last few years, as I grow in my faith and become a little more healthier of a person, I oh. am somebody. I'm a five, which anybody who doesn't know is an investigator, which is somebody that's yeah. really into. Yeah, you. yeah. So I I'm at, at the point now where where the confirmation bias, like I almost have an opposite problem where I could research something to where I get exhausted, to yeah. where I see all perspectives <laughs> and I don't, I can't. I can't make a decision anymore sometimes uh, of what, what I think is true. It's so hard to navigate nowadays. Like there's no, there's like, you could really uh, research anything to confirm what you want to believe. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Especially know. with the internet. 
Yeah. And Google makes us virtually omniscient. We think we are, you know, because yeah. we can Google it. I Google, therefore I know. <laughs> so I'm sure you can find a pretty articulate, you know, well-researched uh, reinforcement of your, of what you already believe to be true. Yeah. And if that's all you're looking for, then uh, you're just going to, f- further dig in your heels in that confirmation bias, or you're going to have more ammunition against people who oppose you for sure. But, you know, Jordan, for people like you who really do try to practice careful, thoughtful examination, you could also, you know, do that forever. You know, it's the, it's the paralysis of analysis and, (laughs) and, Mm, you know, that's where uh, I do think a vote in some ways is kind of a nice deadline for us that if we, want to live up to our, the privilege of voting, um, then in that ballot box, you know, you're going to make the best decision that you know to make, given the information that you've collected at that point, knowing that you are just part of the orchestra of all of humanity trying to make a good decision, and ultimately not trusting that you're smart enough to, to run history. You're just not. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and so I do think that that helps... I, with the humility, but also helps us just make a decision. It's not, not everything in life has a deadline to it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> not every decision in life, that one does. And I'm yeah. kind of thankful for it. It's like, well, November 3rd, God, I'm going to check something. <laughs> and if you mess it up, you got another two to four years to change it. Right. Exactly. That- <laughs> yeah, man. Which is another reason why saying who you vote is not enough of a picture of who you are. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're like, ah, you know what? I, this is what I chose, but I, you know, I could have, Given a couple different details, I might have gone the other way. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> well, anyway, w- one of the things that um, I loved from your from the intro message on this series, you talked about. Uh, you said those who love will always have much more influence than those who mm-hmm. win, which is just such a such a powerful powerful statement because like we do. You, you really do get when you get caught in this world of politics and you think like what you believe is this this war all like it's you could it becomes more about what you're against than what you're for and that's right. I guess maybe that's another way of saying it like it's more important to let people know like who you're for than what you're against I guess I don't know mm-hmm. if that makes sense but mm-hmm. I don't know I, I I don't know if you have anything more to say about that but I just love that whole concept. I think that's a good reflection, you know, to be identified more for what you're for or rather who you're for than who or what you're against. I I think that, you know, it's nice when people who are the most loving also win. We know that that sometimes happens, of course. But the concept is powerful for me because it means that like what I want, I think what God's most interested in is raising the amount of personal influence, like real influence you have in someone's life. So you can have influence based on your title, right? Like I'm the CEO or I'm the president or I'm your dad. And maybe because of the power you have, the people under your leadership have to do what you say, but that doesn't actually mean you have personal influence in their lives. Personal influence is always going to be based on how much I trust you. The people I trust, the more I trust you, the more influence you have in my life, period. Yeah. And how do you earn trust in someone's life? Love. Now, that's a broad category. I'm not just saying being polite. and um, I mean the kind of love that does what we've talked about, gets curious, uh, has great conversations, uh, challenges people, of course. I love you, so I'm going to push back a little bit. I'm going to – you know, I'm going to be honest with you and, but I'm going to stick around. I'm going to earn your trust. And so over time, those who truly actively calorie burning love will always have greater influence in the world than those who just get a title or just win an election uh, or just get a promotion. Um, so that I'd rather choose that because that's something I can do, even if I don't have the title of the promotion, the election. Yeah. That makes sense. (laughs) One of the things that I that I've realized too, and um, it's kind of hopefully not backtracking too much, is just sometimes you're also you're defined by who you don't hate, 
nowadays where it's like, eh, even if you're like your attitude towards a certain candidate or politician is, nah, I could take him or leave him or leave him. Or I don't think he's as bad as everyone's saying, or I don't think, you know, whatever, whatever it is. People even, are like, even if you just don't know, yeah, even if you just right, don't yeah, know, exactly. like, how can yeah. you not? And it, it's so <laughs> difficult. Ugh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's true. And, uh, you know, I I go off, I wrote a, a blog post of, a few weeks ago, uh, which the working title of it was The Cure for Sound Stupiditis. <laughs> but then I landed on the title of One Thing Face Masks Can't Protect Us From. I thought that was more topical. Yeah. Uh, got shared. That helped the algorithms a little bit. <laughs> yeah. um, but in it, I revealed this this framework I use where I say, you know, I always start with, certain assumptions. And one is I am unbelievably biased and only partially informed. Mm. Like I just go off of that assumption that I am unbelievably, even unknowingly biased and partially informed. (laughs) You know, it's so easy for us to comment on the lives of politicians and celebrities of which of, of whose lives we know so little and there's, you know, plenty to comment. If someone said a thing, then like I can have a perspective on what they said, or yeah. if there's evidence they did a thing, I can have a, obviously a perspective on what they did. I'm not saying don't have opinions, yeah. but to think, you know, the totality of a man or woman, um, or know what you would do if you were in their shoes, uh, is pretty arrogant and again, foolish, I think. Yeah, I barely yeah, well, know I think, myself. I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I think that's like the best first step you can take. Like you said, like, you know humility of, of basically admitting how, not necessarily how much you know, but how little you know in regards yeah, to everything. Yeah. And, uh, and I've definitely found that over the years, you know, in my political journey, the first thing that I did have to kind of admit to myself was that I I'm so I'm semi tribalistic by nature, you know, <laughs> even when it comes to like, like Jordan was saying with like movies or brands or whatever, it's like, you know, I would always pick sides when it was like, eventually I came to it just subconsciously. <laughs> yeah. And I came to realize I was like, why, why am I even worried about it? You know, <laughs> hey, who's, who's, you know, who's profiting from this other than just like the, the companies that are, you know, pushing the advertisement. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but I think, I think when you do confront yourself in the mirror and just, you know, definitely say, yeah, I'm, I'm, more prone to, you know, whatever, uh, that's a great starting point. You know, it's, it's a good breakdown and, uh, it, it just really quick in terms of social media, the, because that seems to be a lot of the discourse that things happen on these days. How do you find like navigating social media in terms of it's so non-personal in a way that mm-hmm. it's kind of difficult to, I, I find it's difficult to kind of promote love as much over that, that, mm-hmm. uh, over that uh, spectrum, how do you feel about that? That's a great question. I think I'm learning it, you know, as I go, I think like all of us. And, you know, first of all, I typically will default not to uh, being topical on my social media. I would, or a way that I think about it is I would rather err on personal, not topical. So I might share something I'm personally going through, but I may not quickly offer a perspective on something topical because the whole world's talking about it. I don't at all put pressure on myself that I have to prematurely come up with some sort of cultural statement about it. Um, Now, there are some exceptions to that uh, where I I do feel uh, it's so clear. And I do know that there are people who who I can help to sort of frame their thinking or, or maybe give them a voice in a way they don't feel they have one. Um, and so every once in a while, but it's very rarely, if you look at any of my social media, will I be topical, but I will certainly be personal. So I'm very vulnerable. I'm transparent with my story. You know, someone who I've been in recovery for 17 years, someone who has an eating dis- or has had an eating disorder in the past and struggles with insecurity a, a lot of times. Uh, you know, so I'll be very vulnerable about that. And I actually find that those things transcend the topical moment that we're living in because those are real struggles that people go through all the time. So the personal ends up being more timeless than the topical. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. And that's how I – so I try – frankly, I don't have to navigate much when I do that because I'm just sharing my story. And that's where I feel most uh, helpful. Mm-hmm. It's really you good. Know, on social media. I just share memes. 
<laughs> Man, and if you can inject humor into the world, like yeah. please do it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You're one of the funniest guys I know, man. So just keep it up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, if people want to find you, Joseph. Where where yeah. can they go? Well, the thing I'm most excited about is Radius. Pretty easy to find us, radius.la. And we stream services and have all sorts of other contact content and way to connect with people. And then my personal uh, site is josephbarkley.com. And I've got writings and different teachings on there and also ways to reach out to me personally. So uh, either of those places are, are where I would direct people. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for doing this, man. We got to have you back yeah, on. And time, I mean, I'm sure this topic is going to be <laughs> going to be circled back around a lot over this next year. <laughs> we we got a long way till November. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, man. I'd love to come back on. Love you guys. And I don't know if you are. Do you score me? Am I more gentleman or more scofflaw? Do you by the end? Do you have to I come. No, we that's should good, do that's that. Actually that's actually a good, good idea. Thing. We should, you know what? I, don't know, I, I think you're, you might be in the middle, considered our, our conversation. <laughs> I'd say off. Of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I definitely, I you know, I'd say off of your uh, off of your attitude towards you know all of this, more more gentlemen. You know, you, you're, okay, good. You know, when you when you approach people with love, you know, that's that's a that's kind of a gentlemanly thing to do. So I'll, I'll all right, good, on good. I'll take that. that. He's a lot come to you guys. I feel like you're experts in the subject. <laughs> Although if you still had your your gash on your on your cheek from a couple weeks ago, maybe you would have skewed more scoff. Ah, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> true. No, I, I had a I lost a fight with a drill. <laughs> yeah. It looked like the civil war on my face. Oh. <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> Well, that's it's story. For, well, no, I'll tell it now. So I was drilling into the wall, trying to run a new electrical line, just doing home renovations. What you do in quarantine, right? You yeah. fix and, and I'm pretty handy, but at this point, I at this uh, during this project, I got my face too close to this drill, and it caught on something in the stud inside the wall. I, it wasn't a knot; it was something else. But the bit caught, and so the drill spun around at top speed, and the handle of the drill slaps me in the face. Oh, I don't know if it did, and immediately it was like Stephen King's carry, just blood. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Face yeah. stuff always looks much worse than it is, but it probably hurt really. really yeah. and I'd like to say that I was fighting somebody, but then I would be saying that I broke quarantine to do that, and then that's a political <laughs> yeah. statement. So that so yeah. I'm gonna make I'm gonna make a political statement against drills right now and say they <laughs> suck. Yeah. Just everybody just stick to the manual drills from now on. Those yeah. automatic drills are up to no good. <laughs> right. well, totally. thanks so Amish. Well thanks again, <laughs> Joseph. Uh, we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be back. This part of the show is brought to you by Phoenix Shaving, makers of the most excellent aftershaves, shaving soaps, and all things traditional man. One of my favorite products of theirs are their aftershaves. Phoenix Shaving intentionally blurs the lines between traditional aftershave and classic cologne. Each batch of aftershave cologne is created by using traditional perfuming methods, giving the wearer a high dose of quality skin food matched by the staying power of berry white. Now I tell you this stuff is amazing. It'll it'll make your skin feel great after a shave and the alum and menthol just removes all irritation and razor bumps. Um, they have classic barber scents and even more creative soap and aftershave fragrances. Like my favorite is the tombstone scent. It smells like leather, tobacco, and gunpowder. Pretty unique. So ditch those vials of chemicals you buy at the drugstore every month and grab some artisan soap and aftershaves from Phoenix Shaving. Go to gentlemanscofflaw.com slash shave to help support the show and get some fantastic manly grooming products. Phoenix Shaving. Shaving outside the box. All right. Uh, great talk with JKB. Um, Wisdom. I we'll have to have him back on. And for those of you who like Joseph, go ahead and uh, harass him in the comments and tell him to start a podcast. <laughs> We've been saying that for years. No, I'll grow some ones. hair. <laughs> um, and I said, I don't know why I said Ian McKenzie. I meant Ian Mackay. I think I was thinking of, I've been watching a lot of Finn McKenty, who talks a lot about Ian Mackay. <laughs> And I said, oh, look, Jordan, you can try to cover your tracks as yeah, much I'm, as I, I you know, you, you can try to cover your tracks as much as you want. I, the, it still doesn't change the fact. I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, that's that's such a shame, Donovan. Such a shame. Um, all right. Um, if you want to support the show, if you want to hear more content like this, you could in, yeah, basically become a producer by going over to patreon.com slash gentscofflaw, and you can also get the episodes on video a few days before uh, the rest of uh, the world does. Also, there's a bunch of extras on there. We post uh, stuff that gets maybe cut out of the show, some extras, some, uh, you know, some behind the scenes stuff. Jordan takes his shirt off. Some some real fans only kind of stuff. Yeah, some real know. fans only. Nothing too crazy, but you know, yeah. we got to make money. I do a live a live cast where you could go ahead and uh, uh, put some money in the tip jar and tell me what to do, and uh, maybe I'll do it. Depends on... Put a, uh, put, put a pipe on your head. Depends on how much Evan Williams and uh, and uh, and how much uh, what, what level you plan on giving on Patreon. Um, also... Dangerous. <laughs> you could go to our merchandise page over at gentlemanscofflaw.com. Get yourself a t shirt. Get yourself something to help support the show. That goes into uh, helping produce this. So clothe yourself. You know, clothe yourself clothe with all yourself. our all our wonderful goodness. We've got some new merchandise going up this week um, with a new... We're, we're still going to keep the the shop that we have up there for like accessories and stuff like that, but we've moved over our clothing over to Teespring, uh, which produces much higher quality shirts, the tri-blend kind of stuff, the fit that you can get it in a fitted kind of American apparel style tee, uh, which is what all the kids want these days, right? They don't want, they don't want a Hanes t-shirt. They don't want a Fruit of the Loom t-shirt. They want something that's, uh, you know, maybe made in the USA, you know, maybe a little softer, maybe a little form fitting, maybe. And get, get behind that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so uh, go ahead to gentlemanscofflaw.com and click the support or shop links to be a part of that. Donovan, you are a gentleman and a scofflaw, my friend. And you are a rebel and a renaissance man as usual. Thank you, sir. And you guys have a great week. This has been the Gentleman Scofflaw Podcast. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher. Visit us on the interwebs at gentlemanscofflaw.com. Captain says, there's ice on the river. We ain't getting home if we don't break through. So damn cold, I can't help but shiver. Rise and shine, we got work to do.